Vladimir Putin unleashing a deadly air assault on Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. At least four people have died there after Russia hit the police and intelligence headquarters. And the city streets are filled with broken concrete, every kind of debris that you can imagine, even from inside those buildings because they're just blowing them to bits. In Kyiv, the capital city, civilians have filled the train station racing to escape the capital before the arrival of that 40-mile-long Russian military convoy. Ukrainians forced to abandon everything. I'm feeling a lot of pain and pain, just pain, a lot of pain for my country and my people. Who did you leave behind? <laughs> My husband, my home, my dog, my cats, my life. Trey Yates is live for us in the capital city. Trey. Harris, you can hear the pain in the voices of these Ukrainians. Violence erupted again across the country overnight with the Russians pushing not only from the south but also the northeast. They claim they've taken the city of Kherson in the south, and if this is true, it will be a significant territorial gain for Russian forces who will be able to bring in more soldiers through Crimea. We do know overnight in the second largest city of Kharkiv, there was heavy Russian shelling and strikes. This video shows the police headquarters there on fire after a Russian strike. The scenes of total destruction are getting more widespread in Kharkiv as Russia ramps up attacks on the city. Russian paratroopers reportedly landed in Kharkiv overnight to support the ground offensive in this area. Other images show heavy damage to the residential areas. Despite claims by Russia, they aren't targeting civilians. The images speak for themselves. Further west in Zoltomir, more evidence of Russian forces striking residential homes. As the Russians try to demoralize the Ukrainian people, they've pledged to fight. They're building shelters where they can and digging their heels in when they're ready to push back against these Russian forces. In Kyiv, the Ukrainian defense minister claims two Russian jets were shot down overnight. We were out in the city today and we saw the checkpoints set up across the Ukrainian capital. There are concerns that Russian forces have sent forward troops to try to scope out just how much resistance they're going to face. Harris. Trey, thank you very much. Before we get started here, I just want to bring up something that's hitting uh, our newsroom right now. Senator Ron Wyden, a Democrat from, from Oregon, I believe, just tweeted, this is big. I just introduced legislation to strip Russia of permanent normal trade relations status, giving President Biden the power to raise tariffs on Russian imports. Our reporter then filling in a little bit of detail on this. Democrats are pushing to revoke Russia's most favored nation status, a perk that lets Russians' goods be sold at lower tariffs. We'll continue to follow the news as it happens, but, but you're looking at a situation now uh, where at least economically things are starting to get a little bit tighter. Brett, I, I come to you first of all for reaction to that and then any top line thoughts that you have on the day. Well, Harris, uh, good afternoon. I think there is bipartisan support. There's now a growing Ukraine caucus up on Capitol Hill that is looking for ways to increase what the administration is doing uh, in the sanction realm. Uh, on Russia and increase also the support for Ukraine uh, that can happen short of U.S. troops and NATO troops getting involved directly in the conflict. I think what you're seeing is some movement by the Russian forces, uh, especially in the south, Kherson, uh, Maripol. Uh, these are places where there has been heavy shelling over the last couple of days and the forces have been surrounding those cities, not going in. But now uh, we're getting word that they're going in and occupying. This is a dangerous time. Uh, it's, it's a time where street-to-street -street fighting is going to start happening. And uh, I think that's why you're seeing thousands and thousands trying to leave Kyiv as fast as they can. Brett, before I move on from you, I, I want to ask you about the South, though, because I know Bill Hemmer and I were talking just a couple of days ago. If Putin's army gets that and it can connect breakaway regions in that area, they, they start to build more of a wall up on the southern border, which is just really taking away to uh, places where people can get out. Yeah, it is. And listen, at the beginning, I think there were some people, some experts who believed that what Putin wanted was that Donbass region 
in the east and kind of a land bridge from Russia to Crimea. Right. So it was kind of a s straight line, if you would, to the port. Uh, obviously, he has bigger ambitions uh, for taking over the entire country. But if you control the south, if you control that, the port, uh, that's a significant strategic moment and uh, one where everything will start pushing to the capital city. I mean, it's another place for people to get goods and supplies in. Uh, Kaylee, I caught you out of the corner of my eye nodding as Brett was talking about specifically choking off the south of Ukraine. Yeah, it's clear that he has, Putin has bigger ambitions than just the Donbass region. There's no doubt about it. And he's willing to use terror tactics to get it. Uh, and that is what is so frightening to me. You know, you saw the president of the United States on his way to Marine One uh, just about an hour ago asked point blank, is Russia committing war crimes? His answer was, it's too early to say. Uh, meanwhile, Zelensky has said in no uncertain terms, to quote him directly, this is outright undisguised terror. Attacks on Kharkiv is a war crime. He said that point blank. And when you look at what's happened, Amnesty International pointing to a February 25th attack on a preschool where civilians were inside. Attacks in urban areas, cluster ammunition. Joey Jones gave us a readout of what cluster yes, ammunition did. is yesterday. And I fear, Harris, deeply fear this could get far worse. When you look at what Putin did in Syria, he enabled Assad. Uh, he attacked urban areas, and estimates are he killed anywhere from 14,000 to 24,000 civilians. That's a wide range. I realize that. Um, Air Wars, who tracks this, that's the best they could come up with. This man's a madman. He's willing to use terror to take over that country. Look, Shannon. One of the things that, that Kelly alludes to there is that we couldn't really see everything that was going on in Syria. And look, they tried mightily to take down what basically is a monument uh, there in Ukraine, and that's that gigantic TV tower. They would love nothing more than for Elon Musk to move its Starlink mm. uh, satellite services away from Ukraine so people couldn't show the world what's happening. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing about warfare in 2022. One of the things is that we have social media, we have Skype, we have all been able to talk with members of parliament and people who are stuck there uh, in Ukraine in real time to talk about exactly what's going on, to get the real scoop from people who were there on the ground. I thought it was important that the president mentioned last night what so many of us have been thinking is that these are people who've known freedom and a stable society for 30 years plus years. I mean, these are people who've grown up in that, um, who they do seem stunned that this would actually happen in their civilized, developed cities. Um, this is a society that seemed pretty stable, and so they seem caught off guard and shocked by that. But because they've tasted freedom and they care deeply about their country, they are fighting from a place of passion, a place of heart. That's why so many of them are refusing to leave. That's why these families are separating and these men are staying behind. And in many cases, women that we've talked to are staying behind yes. as well. Um, they are then up against Russian conscripts and people who are forced into this service, many of them not understanding or exactly what they were walking into or what they were going to be doing. And and the more that the Russian army can be demoralized, the better it benefits the Ukrainian people because they are fighting from a place of preserving everything that they know and love and care about. They also have the support of the entire world, if not only spiritually, uh, you know, monetarily, food, supplies, so on and so forth, as long as we can get those things to them. Now, you know, the reports of Russian forces going near Emily, and that was something that was happening this hour yesterday. It did not happen overnight. But we do know that there is at least some thirst for those convoys to get to places where they can cut off supply lines. Mm. And if that were to begin to happen, that is not, that's soul crushing. Because part of what they feel from the rest of us is that support physically, too, around those hubs of Poland, around the border where we can get stuff across. That's exactly right. And a consideration that needs to be taken, about, taken into account as the humanitarian aid and calls for humanitarian aid skyrocket. Carrying the ball from Shannon just a couple yards further, senior Defense Department officials here in this country have reported that those Russian soldiers were sort of the victim, the, the result of propaganda from Putin, that many of them were told they were engaging in training exercises only to find themselves in combat. They've been reported to be surrendering in droves and also engaging in self-sabotage of their vehicles so that they will not have, for example, puncturing gas tanks, so they will not have to be taken into combat. The Ukrainian ambassador to the UN read aloud from a, a text from a then deceased Russian soldier saying, we were told, mom, that we were going to be welcomed with open arms as liberators. Instead, we were called fascists. Mama, he wrote, this is so hard. And two quick points, if I may, to the, um, the, the 
UN condemnation and the sanctions. On the UN condemnation, recall that they have condemned Israel 45 times. In the year 2020, 17 times, three times as many as they have condemned other countries. And so it is absolutely right that they condemn Russia. And I hope we see the same amount of scrutiny from them on this as they have to our allies, Israel. And then to the Senator Wyden call, uh, remember that there's additional forces in play here. So I totally agree with Brett, of course. The bipartisan support is now swelling. But there have been commercial oppositions to, for example, the pitch for sanctions on uranium here in this country against Russia. So note sure. that there are some uh, commercialized interests that we hope are held at bay because humanity is the first and primary consideration for us. I wonder when we'll start to talk about what Americans are willing to do to support with regard to oil, because that's what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. If the American people say, well, you know what, we'll ride a bike for a while, we'll do whatever, we're part of the, you know, to get off the teat of Russian oil, because, yeah. I mean, they are, it is unbelievable. We're now up to 670,000 crude barrels a day. Oh. I mean, just think about the numbers on that above $100 a barrel a day.